Welcome, my name is David Bailey. I'm a life coach and today I'm joined by Richie Watson, life coach and founder of Lifewell UK uh, and all round extraordinaire. Cool guy in sunglasses today. Yeah, Welcome yeah, Richie. Right. Let's explain this quickly because uh, you know, I want to, want to make good, I'm not on holiday. Um, I'm in I'm in my bedroom, but um, I have a, an ongoing health situation, which means uh, a strong lighter version. Hence the sunglasses, and the shirt was just a bad choice when I'm wearing the sunglasses indoors. You know. Yeah. Re- so, really, you're in Hawaii. Let's, let's really, I'm in right? Hawaii, guys. Yeah. That's what it. Uh, it's all like. Uh, I've escaped to Hawaii, and uh, that you know, that'd be fine. But it's not. It's not true. I mean, okay. A very very overcast England right now. Yeah. <laughs> There's no good reason to wear sunglasses other than um, I can't see very well without them at the moment. I've got to go Bono, and I was explaining to David, I'm not happy about it because I'm not a fan. Yeah, well, it's a good look. I'm, I'm uh, yeah. Thanks, man. Contextually, it'd be a good look. If I was on a beach, I'd Yeah, find... you need to be in Thailand would... with me, and then right? be like, oh, yeah, Richie's in Thailand. That's it. That's it. Yeah. The context is everything. I wouldn't have to explain myself. Exactly, yeah. If I was on a beach or in Thailand, yeah. Cool. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about parenting, Um, working with students, working with young people, uh, because I've I've seen a lot of interviews that you've done with uh, my good friend David Savile, and you've covered a lot of different topics, but this is one that uh, I know is pretty close to your heart, but and also one that I've not really heard you speak about um, at length. Yeah, yeah, well, I've done a lot of work there, but um, it's, you know, because the, the, the... the way I work, it can touch so many places. What's happened over the years, David, is you know you start working with people, and then it's like, okay, people ask you what's how it should work. People ask you to serve them in certain domains and areas, and if you can, you you step into it, and that's what's happened with me. Which which, and I've realised that I have this kind of Swiss Army knife of guidance and coaching and mentorship, which applies relationships um, and you know parenting and all these things particularly because my guidance is rooted in evolutionary biopsychology and uh, developmental psychology. So it's like, okay, parenting is something we can open up. But um, more than that, for me, I needed to, I needed to become an expert in this area uh, for my own daughter, because um, after she was born, you know, her, her mother became very ill with postnatal anxiety, depression, and, and a lot of issues. And that, that meant a very unstable home environment for, for the first few years of her life. So um, I needed to really deepen my own my own knowledge and my tools to be able to help her, um, you know, not be traumatized by that instability and, and those issues, and uh, to be able to actually have the firm, firmest foundation she could have. So it became <clears throat> a real obsession of mine, you know, the um, the raising children side of things, and then consequently, you know, parenting guidance to do that work as well. Mm. So you, so before that, had you got any kind of experience with it or was it that when your daughter was born, this, this became a, a mission and you just got, got into learning about it? So um, obviously, we, I think, you know, those who know me are very aware that I, I, I'm a peculiar person. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't a normal child. And um, I actually started to map out what would become my parenting work. Um, after I became an, an uncle, 10 or 11 years old. Um, I've always been obsessed with human behavior. I've always been fascinated by it. I've always been a natural born philosopher. And as, like, as long as I can remember, maybe that's got to do with some experiences I had, I, you know, maybe, or maybe I just fell to earth with that in my soul. I don't know. But um, I, I, I honestly started to take notes and started to map out how I would parent. I didn't know I was going to teach parenting, but I started to map out how I would parent like age 11 onwards. Age 11, um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and because I was obsessed, I was, I was always so obsessed with human behavior, like mm. when I was a, really, a kid. And I was always fucking with it too, because I realized that I could indirectly influence, you know, uh, which a lot of kids do too. But um, I, I was just particularly obsessed with it. Like what stimulus can I provide and what outcome can that create? And it's like, oh, that's fascinating. What, what about now? And um, I think because I was in this mode of thinking for whatever reason, and there's, you know, for whatever reason, um, when I became an uncle and there was these kids around, I, I realized I was far more connected to understanding what was going on for them than anyone else. Like I realized 
just how everybody else could not fathom where these kids were coming from. And they also seem to be like really unaware of the, the unwelcome effects that, um, that their parenting were, were creating, you know, whereas I could see it directly. It's like, look, if you say that, he's going to do that. If you do this, he's mm. going to do that. And this was all quite evident to me. So I, I was, so when I was looking after them too, I'd kind of experiment with that stuff. It's like, wow, this works really well. I kind of avoided some issues here. Um, so yeah, I started to map things out there and that always continued for me because my interest in psychology philosophy took me to, you know, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology and developmental psychology. I studied psychology at college. Uh, so, um, and then of course it became my, my, my work, my field became transformation and development. Mm. And, um, and then you have a, you have a child that's, it's like how many things can go on to pull you into this direction. Then her mother having the difficult she did have, which were profound deep and went on for many years. It was a kind of like, okay, I need to really deepen not only my understanding, but my mastery of this, I need to really live this out. I need to embody this. I need to be able to embody, um, what it is my, my child can then connect with to be able to help her come through these challenges that were already there in her early, early stages of development. And, uh, and also interestingly working with her mother, I say working with her, you know, obviously lived with her in a relationship with her, yeah, but married, there were, yeah. yeah. And, but there was a, a process of me helping her out of that situation. Um, so I was both helping my daughter um, traverse and come through these issues in the healthiest way possible and to integrate them and for them not to become embedded as traumas as such, which then meant she's, she's playing and living these issues out in later life. Um, but I was also helping her mother, my wife at the time, um, through these issues, which were embedded in her own childhood. You know, mm. so the, it was, you know, I, I don't want to sterilize the personal journey and experience. It was, deep and it was heartbreaking and it was you know it's difficult and it was all these things as a human being as a father as a partner um but speaking on this level what i learned through that process was you know I, I couldn't have found through any other that i can imagine because i was able to so deeply connect with where it is these issues actually began while i was trying to help them not take root here in this in this actual childhood, you know, so helping one person go beyond the roots of their trauma, which were rooted in childhood and mm -hmm. simultaneously helping support my daughter. So those roots didn't take in the first place, you know, so it was, um, and we got there, you know, astonishingly because, um, you know, like I say, her mother was in a very deeply difficult place, deeply lost and she was you know, very unwell. Um, but we were able, you know, exploring certain avenues to be able to support her out of that. So, you know, it ended up being a very, it ended up being a very a very good uh, happy happy story. Yeah, and I mean, I I've always been really impressed when I see you and your family and just the way you interact and I know you do homeschooling as well. And I think that that is something that that kind of always stood out to me, like the way just the amount of love and care and attention you you give to your family, and it, it's to me just. It's not like a facade. You just put some stuff on Facebook. I've seen it, and I know that that's how you live. And yeah, uh, it's true. very, really inspiring because I'm working now with uh, teenagers at, at a high school here in Thailand. And of course, I knew that most of the problems we face as adults get kind of wired in when you're at, uh, at home when you're younger. But working with young people who are well, they're living at home and so they're much they're in that experience it's it's a lot more obvious that that you know 99 percent of the problems are coming from things that have were either happening or have happened in um in their home environment yeah 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 absolutely. david you know this is where we so we download the story of what reality is in between the ages of naught and six primarily you know of course you know, certain things go keep on going in, mm. but we we are highly tuned during that period of life to download our environment. You know, so what we learn is reality then becomes the story of life that we live out thereafter. 
and it, and it actually becomes extremely unlikely that that story changes. You know, that's obviously the work we're in is to change those stories, but uh, mm. you know, that's um, even, even a lot of the time in, you know, the self-help world, you know, those stories aren't being changed, just the language and, you know, there's a reframing around them. And that's why people, you know, experience the same cycles and patterns you know, even if they think they're there now or they've got, you know, they've grown past things, they seem to relive it and relive it. That's, um, and a huge part of that is because these stories got downloaded during these, these early developmental stages and they're just wired in really stubbornly. And it's a, it's a genius, it's a genius feat of evolution. This because of course we arrive and we haven't got any idea what's going on. <laughs> you know, we've got instincts, which are very general. Um, but we need to get specific to our environment that we're in. And that's why it works that way. It's like, because you don't know what environment you're going to be born into. So from the moment we're born, you know, we start to fixate on the guardians around us and their demeanor in order to mm. learn them because they're the translators of reality to us. Right. So it's mm. like the, the, the babies look to the, the mothers and fathers, chiefly mothers, because they spend the most time with them typically. And they, what they, what they're trying to do is learn what your, what your language is, nonverbal, because of course they can't speak, they can't communicate. They're learning your physical cues and these visual cues of, of what's going on. Am I safe or not? In order to then work out what's going on in their environment. So this is why you get the phenomenon, and this happens like immediately for the, in the first few weeks. This happens. Mm. And this is established, but then it continues. And it's like a foundation of connection between the parent and the child to mean that the, the, the child looks to the parent to translate the environment and reality and, and specifically whether they're safe or whether they're under threat. So this is when you get the phenomenon we kind of most of us have, have witnessed in some form of like a toddler, maybe in the playground. And I've seen this many times running, falling over on the gravel like a gravel path I'm, I'm mm. particularly remembering one instance i saw <clears throat> now one toddler can do that fall down boom hurt themselves they sting on their hands mm. and what they do is they look they look mm. towards the parent before they react and that's that mechanism right it's like am i safe in this situation or not so the experience is one thing it's like the pain it's like this hurts this isn't fun but am i safe and you mm. look to the look they look to the parent now and if they look to a parent that's given a reassuring smile, that everything's fine, you'll see that kid get up and dust themselves off, carry on playing. And that's, that's what I, you know, look to embody with a, with a decent amount of success. And so that was the experience that I would have uh, for the most part. But then you see if what, if what happens is when the child looks over to the parent to translate the, their reality, am I safe? Am I under threat? Is this okay? Is it not? And the parent like, is jumping and freaking out, jumping out of the, the park bench or whatever. And then the child starts to cry, freaking out, because they're getting this signal of something's desperately wrong here. You know? mm. And so you've got the objective experience, which is one thing, but the subjective experience, which becomes the presiding experience of a, of a human being, because it's like we, we are translating the objective into the subjective and then that mm. becomes our reality. The subjective is coming from these kind of experiences, right? So this obviously is crucially important because we, what we need to do, and this is part of the work I do with Compass Parenting, it's, it's, it's very much about transmuting and transforming our own triggers, our own relationship to things. So we're not just passing on the same things or worse or maybe slightly better or different mm. um, to our children. It's being able to transmute those things and hold space so we can we're able to do something different because they are little sponges. This is kind of like the sponge years. You know, you get the expression, the kids are like sponges. This is why they're downloading their environment. Everything's going in. Their brain waves are fine tuned to be receptive. And it's just, and there's very little discernment, David, you know, they haven't come to that point yet. That comes later, five, six onwards, discernment analysis and then rejection, which you know, is the teenage rebellion stages, you know, we need all of that to happen. They need to also go, shut up everything you're saying is wrong to then experiment and find out what's right or what's wrong for themselves mm -hmm. that's all part of development too but in these in these um earlier stages it's obviously absolutely crucial that we don't fill them with shadows of invisible tigers right that's and that's kind of what a lot of the time we're doing if we if we're um not responding 
of reacting to life in a kind of contextually appropriate way to challenges, you know, where there's an escalation where it's like, you know, some things like no, no use crying over spilled milk. Some things are just a spilled drink. Mm. Some things are threat to life and limb. And it's very helpful for a human being to have it downloaded like appropriately what those things are. Right. And so, you, so you, the alert system of your emotions and, you know, your, your, your bio, you know, your, your bio neurology, you know, it all just, it all is kind of context appropriate to degrees. I and mean, we're going to get things wrong, obviously a lot, mm. but if there's a, a decent kind of framework within the individual of this isn't really much of a problem. I can engage with this without getting into a fight or flight mm. response within me, you know, like having a difference of opinion with someone, we shouldn't be, striving for survival in that moment and then playing trigger tennis we should be yeah. able to have that conversation but that's not normal necessarily um so the work you know i focus on is being able to help parents transmute those internal triggers themselves so they're able to hold a different space for their children pass on more contextually appropriate reactivity and responses to situations right because then they don't grow into adults um wandering around with invisible tigers you know that's kind of the idea. And so how were you able to do that in, in your own situation? Because you said there was, there obviously was a quite a stressful at home environment that, that was, that you were living in. And so was your daughter um, and with your wife. And so how would you be able to, like, if, if you're able to like, talk through, say an example of that, how you would put that into practice if there is, um maybe like a legitimate stressful situation um but you obviously don't want to traumatize your child or uh give them an unnecessary fear that that is not going to be useful so there's just it, it's all about you know experience is king david you know that with development right you know and and if i am if I am influencing her experience with my presence, which I am, because mm. I'm one of the two main people who she's looking to, to translate her experience. And then that becomes part of her experience. Right. Um, then it's about what I embody more than anything. So it's about me being able to, in those moments, when I'm feeling triggered and challenged to be able to hold a space. And obviously that comes it's a process, but um, the the beginning of that is is using these moments when we're triggered and challenged as cues to stop, rather than react. Is cues to stop. So if there isn't a life and death situation, like if there is, obviously react instantly, and that's that's what this that's what things getting downloaded into our high and brain is for because it's a very powerful processing unit which means you can make these decisions very quickly and survive right that's what it's for but it's not for that thing getting spilled or you know these kind of things um the everyday which and which to be clear if if that drink is spilled and you go oh whoops a daisy let's clear that up and we're good and it's like okay what do we do when a drink gets spilled we clear it up mm. but if if that drink gets spilt and it's jumping out, freaking out <gasps> this moment, then what it, that activates fight or flight mechanisms. Yeah. And then that, then that experience gets misassociated, which with a, like a survival situation. Mm. And then what you have is the grown adult reacting to the spilt drink <gasps> with that instinctive, impulsive freak out moment. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what's happening. And, you know, I, don't, I just don't want that for my daughter. No. You know, I don't want her to be, so much better adjusted than that you know and mm. it's normal it's normal people are reacting in this way but this is why and so what we need to do is take ownership of our own triggers and how, how we're reacting responding and that that begins with stopping when we feel stopping when we feel so it's like which is tricky david because what's happening is it's like a, a switch is getting flicked in this moment because the blood flow goes to the hind brain. It's like, okay, now subconscious take over because we're in a survival situation and it's like, it's all, everything's quick. Your mind moves quick, your body moves quick, everything's quick. And you're now kind of living out an unconscious pattern, right? And it's very, very powerful because these are the mechanisms that come into play in order to help you survive. So it's very strong and very powerful. So you have to first recognize that you need to do it and why you need to do it based on you know what i'm talking about 
like I need to do this. I need to not react and then just pass on the same triggers to my kid. Okay, I need to know that. And I need to use, get to know my own triggers, like get to know my, those moments when I'm slipping unconscious. And if I, if I know them and have them very clear in mind, they can actually, I can actually start to inverse that, that cue. Whereas I can, I can bring myself to deeper consciousness and deeper awareness. If I really have them in mind, if I really know when this happens or, and when I react like this, and when I say this thing, um, you know, I call them consciousness cues. So it's like, if you know the stupid things you say when you slip unconscious, if you know the stupid things you do and you get very clear on those things, when you do them and say them, it, they can actually be like um, a hypnosis, hypnosis trigger word, you know, it brings people yeah. out of the trance. Yeah. So you can, you can train yourself and condition yourself to like, if you get, for example, one of my, one of my ones when I'm, I go unconscious and what I mean by li just living out my stupid patterns is my internal uh, monologue is uh, for fuck's sake for fuck's sake will go in my head. And I might even say for fuck's sake, if I catch myself thinking or saying for fuck's sake, I am, I'm living in for fuck's sake consciousness. Right. <laughs> and I don't want to live in there. So what I've done is I've primed that as a consciousness cue. So every, anytime I think for fuck's sake or say for fuck's sake, I'm back in the room, you know, and I'm now able to be present and aware, you know, and no longer in that triggered state. So it's very cool. So it's getting to know your, your reactivities, your, your triggers. And then in those moments when they happen is to stop and feel. And this is the bit that's like takes courage and, and it does take courage. You know, it is a, it's like the most courageous act we can do as a parent, David, is to, is to be able to hold ourselves in those moments and not pass on the same thing, not react. It's like mm. it takes an awful lot of courage. And that's because when we are triggered, we are connected to the roots of what it is that traumatized that trigger into existence. And that is in our childhood. So if you've got a three-year-old, and I'll give an example so I can share a story that's very poignant um, and really speaks to this. You've got a three-year-old that's not putting on their coat and you're going to be late and you need them to put on the coat so you can go, go out and, and not be late. And that's suddenly you're triggered in that moment. What's happening is you're connected to some scenario that you experienced maybe approximately that age but let's be you know let's be general as a three-year-old not putting your coat on getting treated with frustration and impatience okay and then maybe there was some kind of traumatic event where you end up crying getting told off whatever it was so you're experiencing this moment psychologically from a traumatized three-year-old and it's like trying to parent through that is just it's it's just impossible it's impossible so this is my message don't you need to stop and feel don't try and parent through that it's going to be disastrous stop and feel and when we stop and feel into these triggers as they surface what happens is our internal matrices pay attention because it's like if we're not doing the same thing we've always done what's different okay and if we're not freaking out and reacting quickly to this situation well does that mean we're safer than we think we are maybe this isn't the survival situation, right? So all of that opens up and you have the opportunity to then kind of repattern it, recondition yourself. And all of that with stopping and feeling, you know? Mm. So the awareness to notice, the courage to stop where this is seductive pull to freak out, shout, whatever it is to just play out this frustration and this feeling, if you can stop and feel, then you give yourself the opportunity to come into a space like your, your presence within it expands and you can now respond in a way that you'd more prefer, you know, and is a, is a, just a healthier way to navigate this situation. Um, not easy, not easy, mm. but it's a process that we, we, we cultivate our awareness. Um, we transmute our triggers through that process. So it becomes easier and easier over time until we can actually deal with these things, um, you know, with such elegance and grace and that gift, it's the ultimate gift you can give to your children do you know that process and then handing on something different so let me let me give a story a real life example of this i work with a young mother who was again like so many parents seemingly or feeling like a breaking point just so overwhelmed why because from the moment your child is born you're opening up a portal to your own childhood and now you're meeting it you can't avoid it you you you, you will find beforehand you seemed maybe <laughs> to whatever degree overjoyed during the pregnancy period maybe you know likely and when they're born wow amazing and you look at them with all this love and it's like 
it's like someone come along and said, well, you know, you're going to be screaming at this kid in a couple of years in the supermarket. You go, no, I'm never going to be doing that. That's not mm. what, that's not going to happen. So, you know, it's like what, what is going on? And that's what's opened up within the parent, you know, like this direct connection, unconscious mm. connection to their own deepest traumas, their own experience of childhood. However, they may see their childhood as good, bad, whatever. There are these traumatic experiences with the, which a young mind really struggle to deal with. And then it becomes downloaded into you. You become it. You live it out. And then it's like, okay, and this is what the mechanism is for. This situation is happening. Well, I know what to do in this. It's to firstly, well, you firstly feel the trauma. You know, it's like you feel the, the trauma of what you experienced then. It's like, now I know what to do. It's the same thing your parents did, right? Freak out, shout, whatever it is. You know, that's what you've downloaded. That's the experience. So you're kind of regressing in that moment to, the, the, that's to that it. pain and you're, That's you're trying to recontextualize safety in that experience. So you're not just acting out in that, that, that kind of traumatized way. And then because left your own devices, you. left your own devices, you will just act it out. Mm. And, and even if you know, cause this is the experience and this, this young mother I'm talking about was having, it's like, this happens, you know, it's like, can't get into typical experience. I said, give me a typical, there's loads of different scenarios. But it's like, give me something typical. Okay. Well, this happened couple of days ago wouldn't put his coat on need him to put his coat i'm gonna be late i end up you know telling him off forcing his car out he's crying i'm shouting and now there's some point that happens after that which she starts to feel terribly guilty and horrible and so now she's feeling bad about herself mm. but that's not helping her you know it depends because she's not doing what she needs to do with that bad feeling and we'll come mm -hmm. to that but it's like this cycle of not being able to cope overreacting and feeling really guilty and horrible about the overreaction. And this is the cycle. And then everything is just really difficult. So first it's like, okay, let me explain to you what's happening in these moments, because like you just said, said, David, it's, a, it's there's a regression happening in this moment. You're not just experiencing this moment with this huge amount of frustration. You're not because you love your child. You know, you love them deeply you are being triggered to these moments from your past and, and that is literally echoing into the present and through that consciousness you're trying to parent and it's impossible it's like look you did not choose that you know it happened to you okay you're not to blame you're not at fault for this living in you and then coming out in these moments okay so there's that let's take away the blame game all right we can and it's the, don't don't try and pass it to your parents either because they can just pass it to theirs you know we <laughs> just take back to go. <laughs> for, forever right yeah. forever that, that baton goes back to the amoebas mm. um and so it's okay let's take away the blame because you're not you're not you're not to blame for what it is got downloaded into you and so what it is you're contending with now but then we come to but you are responsible now in this moment for what you do and it's so so now you know this we need to do something with this and it is your responsibility not to do the, the same thing here. Okay. So it's like, okay, that blame thing is a relief. It's like whew, that responsibility, hopefully this end empowering, you know, and some of it should be a pressure. That's okay. That's, you know, responsibility has to have that, but with responsibility gives you, if you break down the word, the ability to respond, that's what responsibility means. Mm. So you can now influence and change things. You can make them different. That's why you want responsibility. You want to, evaporate the whole blame consciousness thing and come into responsibility and ownership because then you can actually create influence positive influence change things for the better so it's like okay you bring come into that relief we come into that empowered responsibility and now it's use these moments as your cues to stop and feel okay so i'm giving this to this young mother and <clears throat> it doesn't come you know i'd say it doesn't come quickly i think it was quite swift actually in all things considered i think we were like a a few weeks down the line really till I got this wonderful we had this wonderful session where it's like you know I did the thing you know there's all this so excited and feeling great I did the thing I did the thing um okay well tell me tell me how that works like, well you know it happened again he wouldn't put his coat on and uh you know so and I noticed I realized I was in that situation and I realized I was getting triggered so what did you do I stopped and felt okay and, and how was that it was fucking horrible right? because <laughs> that, that's the experience you're, you're, you're meeting the pain deeper because you're mm. acknowledging it more you're more consciously with it and so it's like it takes that courage to hold it and so she's in it and with it and she's holding it 
And then through that process, and she'd been building up to this because she's been experimenting with stopping and feeling for a period of time. And there came this point where she said she just found herself. It just, just felt like she expanded within and it just seemed to evaporate. And then she just found herself saying the words, okay, if you don't want to put your coat on, that's fine. Let's go. They got outside the door, David, the kid took a couple of steps, turned to his mum and said, mum, I'm cold. Can I have my coat? <laughs> right. And it's like, that is such a great example. And like multiply that by a year, two years, three, multiply that by your experience as a parent. And that's how it can be. It's like, and from this state of triggered consciousness, she couldn't see that elegant solution. She didn't have access to it. All she had access to was built from her history. But being able to transmute that by being in and with, by stopping and feeling, transmuting it and coming into a different state where a presence, as I describe it, figuratively, a presence within the emotion expands, suddenly something else comes into view, something else comes into consciousness, a different possibility. And it's like, why am I in this tug of war with this, this kid? Fine, don't wear your coat. And then his own experience is, oh, well, have a coat, right? Um, and that, I mean, that solves so many problems, David. Mm. Um, and so in that process, what this heroic mother's done is transmute her own traumas to the degree she has in that situation and passed on something different to her child in that moment of consciousness um, so that her child can grow up being someone, okay, fine, if you don't want your coat, it's up to you, it's your body. And, you know, can, can, can have that presence and that clarity because they haven't basically been triggered with a fight or flight survival response in, in an everyday situation, you know. So really, really, you know, beautiful. And like I said, it speaks to the experience that we can have as parents. Yeah, that's a really amazing example. And um, I think, yeah, list, to, like you're saying that, really lead by example is, is the heart of it. It's like whatever you want your child to do or however you would like them to be, if you can be that yourself, then that's how they're going to really learn the, the quickest or most effectively. Hence compass parenting, you know, that's exactly the approach of compass parenting. And it's all, it's all about embodiment, you know, because mm. monkey see monkey do. Yeah. Uh, but not only that monkey experience, monkey become, <laughs> you know, and so it's it's about yeah it's about what we embody so that as as I've mapped out it's the process of transmuting those things for us and then passing on something mm. and it's through again through the embodiment you know, like we have these um these expressions like um, do as I say not do as I do right well it's like yeah good luck good luck with that because mm. that is not how it works it just doesn't you know verbal lessons are, are altogether secondary to experiential mm. um, and that's why and also because of you know appreciating the development stages of children uh i i focus a lot on nonverbal communication and providing ex experiences of growth rather than verbal lessons which they can't really properly formulate fathom um and then and then remember you know so he, he, let me he, give you a an example of this man because this is how deep like we can go so deep when it comes to parenting hmm. um and this is this really opens this up and helps it helps people can see how this works so so from the ages of naught to naught to two predominantly delta waves our brain is in so it's like that's when that's when we're in deep sleep this is like really open sensitive subconscious then we get into the theta waves and this is kind of like a state of super learning or super absorption i prefer to say and so like everything's going in like what monkey experience monkey become um with very little discernment because that comes later that the the, the rejection phase you know when it's like hang on a minute my parents have been talking shit all this time you know but um you know they're, they're very much just they're down downloading their experience of life and it's going in and it's going in fast and effectively more effectively than any other period of life i've lost my thread david this happens at the moment in my current set, but it's what so, so you're talking about the uh, the different stages of stages of development yeah 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 but why was i going and into the brain waves and how uh, how that affects 
monkey see monkey do monkey, monkey, see, experience. monkey experience monkey become um sorry give me a moment and we'll be there dead air what are we gonna do we you were talking see? about how deep um this goes got it i've got it thanks man thanks man okay so so what the reason i opened up and the theta waves and then we go to alpha after five six and there's this um so it's like being in a hypnotic state. That's what you can equate mm. to because those are when we're in hypnosis or deep meditation, we're in a, a theta alpha kind of cycle. And that's what children are in between the ages of approximately two, um, six, seven, eight. Okay. And then we're moving to beta, which is the adult brainwave state. So we're in a phase, it's like super learning, super absorption, and then discernment comes later. And so they're so sensitive, man. They're so sensitive. They're like like psychologically they're like this open nerve mm. like just receiving it's like we, and we've got to appreciate that you know and, and, and understand that and then have some practical approaches in which how to best um nurture and cultivate these human beings at this stage where their literally their reality is being formulated that they'll live out for the rest of their lives right mm. so i'm about to lose my thread again so um so the reason i'm i'm mentioning that is because um say say a a child does something you don't want them to do okay and maybe they've drawn on the walls okay so it's like this four-year-old kid who's in predominantly theta brain wave state of um so heightened suggestibility right mm -hmm. so a, a, a form of hypno hypnotic state they've written on these walls right so you come and you tell them off right okay let's sideline how we do that for a moment to make this point uh, but maybe they've been told off and told not to do it Okay, and you're upset about it happening because you know there's all this fucking shit all over your walls. I didn't respond like that, by the way. Um, yeah, um, I responded differently, but, I, um, I, but 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 it's typical. I I, I just want to share a quick story. I, I I remember when I was a kid, I think about three or something. I I thought it'd be a good idea just to peel the wallpaper off the walls. <laughs> Why, Why not? Because yeah, you're experimenting. So, what? How yeah. does this work? Yeah. Um. And uh, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my daughter, because <laughs> this is the this is one of the things, right? My daughter, I can't remember how old she was, but she wrote <laughs> she wrote loads of messages of loving messages for us. Like one was on our boiler in the boiler cupboard, like "Mummy and Daddy, I love you and enjoy." <laughs> And it, it was in permanent marker, David. That was oh. the pen she found, right? Yeah. So we had boiler, boiler recently replaced, but up until then it was on there. And on the, um, like we hadn't long had our windows replaced, the window sills and everything. She wrote on the white window sills, these mm. messages. And they're not going anywhere. They, they're yeah. in permanent marker. So this happened. And because I see what's happening, she's doing this. She doesn't know. She doesn't get mm. it. And she's just being loving. And so what well, I'm going to come mm. along now and be brutish about her expressing love. Yeah, good job, Richie. That's gonna. That's what. What effects that gonna have? Mm. So I had to, I had to actually hold a space where I acknowledge what she, her intention, and and appreciate that, but then let her know that's not what she does, and she mustn't do that. And very importantly, because this was really the issue, keep the fucking permanent markers out of her reach at that yeah. age. You know, it's not actually her fault. It was our fault because her pump markers shouldn't even been around. Right. And that's mm. again, something we've got to take ownership as parents. It's like, it's like when parents try and um, <laughs> do like painting indoors with a two-year-old mm. and it's like, and then they're constantly policing the kid to not put paint on the floor or the carpet or the walls. It's like, don't do painting in the house with a two-year-old. Don't do it yet. They, they can't, properly process what's happening they can't take instructions you're going to have to really heavily discipline them basically make it a miserable experience wait wait until they can actually do this thing it's, they're in the right zone of proximal development where they can actually do this thing and it not be this traumatic event because um, you know and this happens often like parents try and do something that kids aren't ready for and it's a constant process of discipline and policing and it's just awful mm. and you know you might hear kids kids the, the parents start to actually get quite blame centric towards the kid for ruining it and it's like no you ruined it because you picked the wrong activity um anyway coming to the point say kids drawn on the walls have been told off okay fine now later that day or that week um and i'm going to put it in the concept of mother because it's more typical for mothers because mothers a lot of their uh, social lives with other mothers is 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 um centered on talking about what their kids have done or been doing okay and it's it's really typical and it's an exchange right and it's like 
all fine except for this moment when um when they tell the story of the kid having done that thing now what they're doing is implanting a hypnotic suggestion for the kid to do it again if the kid's in earshot of you telling the story about the thing they did that you don't want them to do again you're actually parenting them to do it again does that make sense yeah so because e e everything's not... a suggestion yeah they're in that everything's suggestion a suggestion state. yeah and and not only that so not only is it a deep suggestion to do it again <laughs> like if you let them be told them off that's their experience right likely not going to do it again but you now telling this the funny story among your friends means that um now one thing is now it all seems like fun so that's kind of confusing and disorienting anyway right and this mm. happens an awful lot an awful lot it's yeah. very confusing for a kid's hammock hey, you're telling this funny story i should do that thing again so that's on a conceptual level but on on the unconscious level you're implanting a hypnotic suggestion for them to do it again okay mm. so everything we say is a suggestion even if we use the word not and don't <laughs> it's like if if possible don't bother mentioning the thing <laughs> yeah. just try and orient them towards preferred behavior you know, you've, far just, better. Uh, you've just regressed me there richie because i remember um i can't remember a specific incident but i do remember being in an environment when i was a kid very young and my parents talking about me and like say so you said it like it might be a funny thing or a what you know a disciplined thing and, and just being confused because it was like i'm not there but obviously i am there but they're talking about me like you know like i'm i'm not there because i'm just a kid and uh they're having an adult conversation and i'm a kid but it, I, I do remember being confused like what well, like this is a bit weird yeah we we you know it it depends what you what outcome you want right if you want the kids to carry on doing the things you don't want them to do carry on talking about them <laughs> doing the mm. things but um but if not don't do that you know so take some awareness and discipline and just a reorientation of our communication and what we talk about um and who we talk about it with you can talk about it of course with the kids not in earshot mm. um so as to build on this this is this is really deep and profound because um what we're doing because we're implanting suggestions for how they behave in these moments and they're because so, they're so receptive um here's one that's common so you've got a sibling dynamic so i'll say an older brother younger sister and maybe the older brother is being uh, overly rush rough with the younger sister um and it's a problem and that this is kind of something that typical play typically plays out and it's like difficult to to deal with and manage um and this is partly why what the parent might fall into doing is you know so stop being so horrible to your sister right okay you're fine you're saying stop being so horrible to your sister but you're also saying be horrible to your sister okay so it's like stop being horrible to your sister is one thing that doesn't necessarily get the outcome you want because of this the, the state that they're that they're in and the receptivity the other thing is if you say things and this is this is really really bad but it's kind of typical too you're always being horrible to your sister yeah there you go hypnotic suggestion you're always being horrible to your sister and then you might say it to other people again having the conversation oh he's always mm. being horrible to his sister and you're 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 literally implanting that suggestion for them to continue to be that way okay so this is what we we, we need to do instead is whatever seed of the preferable behavior that we want them to step into you have to focus in on that. Okay. You focus in on that. Now, I'm not saying ignore the bad behavior. I'm not saying that you do. We need a, a mixture of positive and negative reinforcement. It's just that we need to do it like well. And um, when it comes to the positive reinforcement, this is something I really encourage. It's giving a heroic role and it can be out of as the, the smallest behavior. But if you give a heroic role to your child, they will start to live it out. Okay. So it's like if he's, been horrible to his sister for like three weeks and he's been horrible to his sister all day but on there's a one moment where he's even like slightly considerate or caring or loving maybe she drops something he picks it up for her maybe he helps her up the stairs or, you know whatever it is maybe pass something to her whatever it is you hone in on that and you you 
you reinforce that and you say oh that's wonderful oh you're so and you and you say this you don't say you're always horrible to your sister you say you're so helpful to your younger sister you're so good with her and you reinforce those ideas and you apply no suggestion even if it's the first time he's ever done it you mm. say you are so good with your sister and you give that that role over and when you talk about him you then say oh earlier on he was so good his sister, his sister drops out and he got right down picked it up and passed it to her you're that's that's the role he will step into and start to live out okay mm. and it is magic it's so effective it's so so effective um but you can see can see you can see how that can work right easily so you can see how the, the opposite is working to condition mm. the child to do exactly what you don't want them to do and become exactly who you don't want them to be so you're kind of creating a narrative for them almost. That's it. And you're implanting it. It's like Inception, David. Yeah. You know, you're because of the, the stage of development they're at, you're planting that seed deep within them. You know, you're literally planting that seed for them to become that human being in adult life. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's very really cool. It's really like cool. So, yeah. And you see, you see how deep and far reaching this this goes if you if you understand it. Um, and if you start uh, applying it in multiple areas. Mm. So the, I, I wanted to ask you, like, I think this applies, like how to set rules and, and discipline uh, kids, because I think that the, these things tie into what you've just shared. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you've, you've brought that up. And now, and I'm going to be careful because this is the thing, when people do, get a bit of an idea they can easily make things worse trying to apply it so i'm going to be, be very careful with how i unpack this um because you know how much time do we have david actually uh well, i've got um all the time in the world for you richie so yeah, yeah. I, I, but yeah as long as you've got it yeah i'm i'm free okay. for the next hour so i'm not oh great not okay man okay right but okay well, let's go I don't let's go you longer if, if you can't no, it's cool, man. I'm good. I haven't got my daughter for, for another while yet today. And um, yeah, my, that's, that's, you know, my afternoon's pretty, pretty clear. So for, we'll see what happens within the next 30 minutes. Out. Um, okay. So I have um, a four stage of deep discipline process. Hmm. Okay. And so I'll give that and then talk a little bit more about um, a little bit more about what comes underneath it. Um, so, and, and this is like, this takes away everything that, that can cause the agony. This takes away the need to shout, raise your voice, need to lose your shit. This takes all of it away if you follow these four steps. And, I'm, I'm, it, and it always works. I'm on the edge and, of my seat here, Richard. Right? <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> know, <it> <laughs> you know, well, I have to because it's like, yeah. I want you to receive this, whoever's listening, because... Yeah. Um, uh, I know, David, I don't go absolutist. I'm an integrist. I am always in spectrums and degrees. Uh, always yeah. in spectrums and degrees. Apart from men and apart from with this. <laughs> and, uh, there's some, there's some <laughs> things the where it's like, there's, there's some things that just work if yeah. you do them and don't when you don't. And this is the fourth stage. You have to, you have to identify uh, something you can leverage. So something that they want to happen or don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a positive consequence or a negative consequence okay mm. um so it's like maybe you're going out for, yeah but here's the thing you've got to be able to select things so this becomes the reason they listen to you um because it's like why would they not do the thing they want to do in this moment because they're going to lose out on something that they really want more than that okay mm. and so we and we we need to bring this in we need to bring this in because you know I'm going to go into this a bit deeper, but our parenting should be a, a simulation of life itself. So we should be simulating how life works so they can rock up to life and just fucking own it. Right? That's how our parenting should work. So in our behavior, there is obviously positive reward outcomes and negative consequence outcomes. That's in, in just in life. So we need to be able to um, nurture their consciousness to be able to work with that in a healthy way and respond accordingly so we need to find that thing now with my daughter she just loves programs man she loves like her kids shows and things mm. she loves them so that's our main leverage is <laughs> whether she gets to watch them or not and how many she gets to watch okay and when so if she's doing something like he, he, let me give you the four stage process um in in real time okay so i've asked her to tidy her room okay 
So step one is I ask her to do the thing lovingly and encouragingly. Hey, honey, can you tidy your room? Okay. Stage one, you ask to do the thing. Now, it could be to stop doing something, but this is to do something. Okay. Oh, honey, could you tidy your room? It's got to be messy. We need to keep on top of that. Could you tidy your room? Okay. She doesn't tidy her room. Step two, remind lovingly and encouragingly now most parents have already have already fucked up by stage two right because they go from naught to 60 far too often i might not have even done stage one right actually it's just like too forthright too firm too unloving with stage one we go stage one loving encouraging we go stage two remind loving encouraging okay she still hasn't done it stage three remind but put in their awareness the consequence of what's going to happen if they don't do it okay so stage three so stage one do ask them to do it love and encouraging remind love and encouraging now stage three is like if you don't do that this thing is going to happen you don't want to happen or this thing isn't going to happen that you want to happen mm. stage three stage four they still haven't done it you follow through on the consequence that is it that is it four simple stages you don't need to shout you don't need to lose your shit you don't need to get in a tug of war with them if you follow through on these consistently the change behavior will happen within days and within weeks they'll have a completely different program downloaded and running but it's all on us to be consistent with it and so that means you've got to be careful with what you identify as a consequence because otherwise you get this this effect david like right if you do that one more time we're leaving like you're in the park or something right or wherever Right, if you do that one more time, you're leaving. They ain't ever going to leave. They want to be there They're with their friends or on a day out in the park or whatever. Right, if you do that one more time, we're leaving. And the consequence doesn't come because mm. they've just reacted. They haven't, you haven't formulated this process before. And it's just whatever. And it's usually the biggest thing they can think of in the moment, you know, but they don't want to follow through. Right, we're not going on holiday if you do that anymore. You know, it's like stuff like that. It's like... And then there's this, the child just learns, well, you're full of shit. So I'm just going to carry on doing what I'm doing until you lose your shit. Then I'll get upset. Um, then I'll be upset long enough that you'll give me what I want again. <laughs> you know, and that pattern plays out. David. So it's like being clear. Okay. Like with Emily, it's a reasonable, I don't, I can take away her programs. It's a bit of an inconvenience to me because she might be a pain. So I've got to be willing to take that inconvenience. I've got to be willing to weather that because I can't give in. Okay. Um, I've got to follow through. Okay. And it's like in such a short period of time, the behavior will be adjusted. Right. And this all sounds a bit formal and a bit disciplined, but you need this in. And I tell you what it does. My daughter loves, like, she's always referred to as a daddy's girl. She's all over me. She loves me. And yet I am this presence where I am the presider of consequences in her world. And that's part of what formulates this deep connection and love because um, there's something within her that's connecting with this, then that this is good you know and you know that it's actually helping her because she gets that it helps her experience life better on some level you know and i am connected with that so there's a depth to our love which is beyond giving them whatever they want when they want it which messes up their consciousness you're literally you're literally um disrupting millions of years of evolution while you're doing that and i'll explain that in a moment but let me um, just continue unpacking these four stages first um so you need to be able to follow through you need to go through your own agony. <coughs> you need you need a cough sweet. <laughs> if we were in a coaching session, David, I'd be going well deep into this cough. <laughs> Are we good? We're good. Okay. Um, you need to deal with your own discomfort following through on the consequence. Um, it's okay for them to be pissed off with you. Believe me, that would deepen your bond over time when you get to the outcome and they're, they're better adjusted. And in no time at all, no time at all. Um, what is messing with your relationship is the, the inconsistency. Then there's no respect going with their love. There's no appreciation of your consistency, to, you know, and it's disrupting things in that way. It's like the inconsistency is a real problem. Um, your bond will will deepen with with this consistency and their behavior will change you'll be happier everything gets better with their improved behavior plus they'll grow to become someone that can um, live life far 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 better okay so that's the four four stages of deep discipline um, and i'm not sure if anything's 
um, missing from that. So, and I, again, I want to be careful that I'm not missing something that's important. Um, ah, yes, this is important. So you open up space for good negotiation. Okay, so you don't want to be militant about it. You want to be reasonable about it too, because um, what you also want to do is help them become someone that can negotiate reasonably, right? Mm. And you want to reward that. So here's how that can go. Right, honey, um, I've, I've told you this was happened. Now it's going to be three days with no programs, right? And then I get this response, David, and I do get this response. What can I do, dad, to make it just one day? <clears throat> That's what's happened through this process. So not, oh, no, dad, no, 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 you know, and whining and moaning mm. and, and caught and disrupting and all that kind of stuff. That would happen in the beginning stages. But then what I do, David, I go, if you carry on, it's going to be four. Okay. So then they would, and then she carries on, it's going to be five. Mm -hmm. And that has to be followed through, right? But then she learns, dad, dad says what he, what he says is going to happen. So once I say, if you carry on, it's going to be four, it stops. And then when you come to, okay, all the way to this process of, you know, then it might be, she's awesome for that day. And I go, I tell you what, honey, you know what? We'll make it, you can watch programs again tomorrow because you've been fantastic today. The way you've changed your attitude and adjusted your behavior. Mm -hmm. Then she learns that. And then she learns that negotiation. What can I do today? I go, okay, honey, if you do the dishwasher, if you do the hoovering, if you do this, if you get on with it, if you change your attitude, then we'll look at it tomorrow, right? Mm. So that's what can happen and will happen through the consistent process. Okay, yeah. Is there any questions over that, David, before I move yeah, on? Yeah, there is, because it, it's, it's calling to mind, um, I was staying with some friends in Korea and one of the, <clears throat> one of the things I observed in the family, there was a young boy around uh, around eight and very demanding. Uh, like, for example, we'd be having dinner with the family and friends and he would just demand that his mum get up and make him some pudding or, or like he doesn't like the food and he wants this thing that's going to take half an hour for her to do. And I, I remember speaking to her about it and, I you know, it, I, I was staying at her house. I didn't want to tell her how to parent her kids but I, I was just saying like how you know what kind of why do you let him get away with that because it, it seemed like he was calling the he not seemed like he was calling the shots and she said well I don't want to see him unhappy because he would just throw a tantrum if she was like right okay no you're not having it he would just cry and cause a scene and she didn't feel uh she didn't know how to deal with that she didn't like know how to um, parent him in that moment where he was having a tantrum. And so I'm just uh, thinking, how would you suggest in, in those kind of scenarios? Because if you, perhaps some parents, if they, they haven't done this typically, and then all of a sudden they're like, hey, I'm taking away your phone. Probably yeah. the kid is going to throw a tantrum. Oh, yeah. And, and oh, yeah. so I'm just like thinking at how... Um, for parents that don't know how to handle that kind of behavior, what, what would you suggest? So, um, so first, actually, I want to, I don't like the word tantrum. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to be all snowflakey about this. <clears> it's <throat> like in real terms, like there can be tantrums, but the problem is what we do, adults conflate their experience with children's and children are oh, young man and mm. they're dealing with strong emotions and it's like to what we do is we conflate all, all, all these episodes as tantrums. And that's, that's, that's not the right way to look at things. And that, that leads to then acting in ways that are, um, are only going to cause problems and traumas. So like, so that's some of the, like in a situation like that, the kids used to something that's part of their reality. It always has been, uh, things gone a certain way and they've got their way and they feel safe because of that. Mm -hmm. And if that suddenly is being changed, and a whole reality is suddenly like, you know, turned inside out, that can be very distressing. And it's like, okay, so that's happening. They're expressing distress, which is normal and natural. So you're going to, you're going to meet him. This is part of what I say with be prepared to go through the discomfort. You're going to have to go through that, but it's very, very important. that when we're following these, these stages and applying the consequence, <clears throat> we don't do it through anger. Okay. Mm. You know, it's like we, we, we're just applying the consequence. Like I said, as a proxy for life, 
as a simulation of life you know it's like one thing I, I, my daughter understood because I, I told it and I, I embodied it is that you know this is how life works is what you say to it this is how life works and it's part of my job you know this is what I've got to do is to 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 do this you know I I wasn't the one that chose it you know you chose it and I gave you the choices you know and so I didn't get you know she she understood that because it was it was done and it was communicated so it's like this is how life works and so don't get angry because if you start getting angry with it then that's different that's that's mm. no longer this is how life works this is you projecting your anger okay so that muddies things up and this is what the stages are for actually to help alleviate that so if you follow them through you shouldn't need to get angry okay and you do them consistently it should take that away um so again you just apply the consequence now the consequence the objective thing itself is going to cause distress so you've got to be able to be there with them through that so don't go well i told you so don't be don't just don't be a dick about it okay be be a supportive presence through that process just be there and go like so me i'd be like you know i understand honey. i understand i do understand but you do see that you know i i told you this would happen and now it's happened so but i do understand yeah i know i know i know it's no fun right i know i know you know it's like i'm there and empathize with the process but the process it's still existing and no amount of tantrums is going to change reality it's like man this is important it's like you kicking and screaming isn't going to get your way right it's being able to engage with the situation well which is and but while you're in this distress i empathize i get it you know I'll, really this is about connecting with your child in that moment really connecting with them and feeling that you know it's like feeling that they're they're, they're going through pain and distress right now it's like so you don't need me to tell you what to say in those moments mm. you know just be supportive and loving um don't not apply the consequence though you know that's mm. that's so you've got to go through that together and it's again it's holding space for yourself to be connected and loving and it's allowing them to go through that process and what we would what we need for them so in anything that could be termed as a tantrum um allowing them the space to feel through it david so important and what we do and this you see where my feeling focused approach is born out of is what we do is we try and submit we, we try and do anything to stop them feeling you know give them the thing that they want give distract them make them laugh anything to stop them crying to stop them, especially if we're in public because what would the vicar say you know and that mentality of what people yeah. think it's like fuck them like you know especially grown adults you know it's like they can deal with it they can deal with it. if they can't deal with it maybe they need to do some work right yeah your your responsibility is here with this you know brand new human being trying to get to grips with life your responsibility isn't for that 30 plus year old child who hasn't yet um been able to manage themselves and their emotions okay um, with love because of you know but more love here right it's just how it goes so um you're gonna need to go through that let them and just hold space for them, man it's magical david i've seen some things on social media videos i never like it when parents show videos of them going for a process with their children i think you know you know i never i never videoed myself holding space for emily when she was crying you know i get i get what people do i get that people can benefit from it you still it's still like I'll, I'll just press record while my daughter's going through this episode. You know, it's like, no, no, no. I don't like that at all. Um, but they're, they're, they're at least close. They're in an approximate place of where we should be, where we need to go, which is allow them to feel, not basically get them to suppress that feeling so it doesn't get yeah. to be expressed. And then it has, you know, it's it's then a, an, un, uh, an unreconciled trauma experience. If um because trauma is, is very important, trauma isn't about so much about what happened as what happens after what happens. Mm. So because it's like everything, the experience of trauma, although painful and horrible, um, it's you know, our, our, our neural wiring just comes online. It's like what what's happening here, what's the story, what can we learn? And it's like if, if an outcome ends up being supportive, then that will be infused within the trauma experience itself. So now it's not so much a trauma that it becomes a trauma trigger that people live out. It can become strength, clarity and wisdom, right? 
Um, so it's like the outcome is very important. So what in any trauma situation, and if the child's expressing trauma, it's how you sit with them through that and what happens on the other side um, is very, very important. So one, they're expressing, which, which allows it not to become suppressed in a trauma form. And two, you're there to be able to support them through it, to help them feel safe to express, to go through it. And the outcome is something positive, where it be a hug or connection, or even, you know, now you've got, I mean, it's been, there's been a situation where Abby's been in a deep expression of trauma for a long period of time. And once she's got herself through it, it's like, okay, it's good. You've done well. And then now I might reward that in some way, you know, um, because that it takes something to get yourself out of that state. If you're not being distracted, given chocolate, made laugh or, 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 you know, even worse being told off until you suppress it. I mean, that's the worst thing, you know, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about you know it's like oh yeah let's 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 put let's suppress it with more fear you know that's a that's a real trauma shit storm that's going to open up like a jack-in-the-box at some point mm. you know so yeah allowing them to that space to express man it's it's so key for as long and as deeply as they need to and you just be there as a reassuring presence you know what i call supported soothing um because we've got these two camps of like um like attachment parenting was like just pick them up and connect with them anytime they feel anything and then there's um letting them self-soothe and uh, there's reason both of those things exist that's because they both work within degrees there's truth within both of them but do them both absolutely and it's a bad idea coming to a midpoint with like most of these things there's an, uh, a nuanced approach so it's like do a bit of both it's like the reason we have um self-soothing exists is because we know we can we can raise absolute snowflakes with no resilience and really weak if we don't, if they don't learn how to self-soothe in some way. Okay. Um, and the reason we have this attachment parenting is because we know that can, that done badly or too much can lead to all sorts of, of trauma issues as well. So here in the middle, if we can, for example, instead of leaving a child in the room to self-soothe and instead of just picking them up every time they feel anything emotional, so they don't get a chance to express for themselves and, have, and develop any sovereignty of expression. Instead of that, if you can be with them, even as a baby, like, so I'd, I'd sit by her while she was having this. So I wouldn't necessarily pick her up straight away. I'd sit by her, maybe I'd stroke her hand and look at her reassuring me. I'd be in a presence with her if she was going through what we could describe as a tantrum perhaps um but and that's why i call supported soothing okay so it's like it's both it's both she's there you know feeling a certain amount of safety you're in the room and you're being you have holding a loving presence um but she's also not necessarily being picked up and brought into this really comforting space she is coming to the place herself with your support right so it's like those kind of ideas um and so, yeah, so it's going through that. And if obviously mistakes have been made incrementally over a long period to get to the point that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so what I'd encourage is, you know, there's this interplay between um, being responsive for your, to your child's needs, but also cultivating some uh, presence and patience with not getting what you want immediately. And mm. so um, leaving, it's doing both because you need them to grow into someone who can act, you know, for example, um, ask them to do something and they do it straight away. Now, if every time they've asked you to do something, you always delay it, they'll, they'll become the kid that does that and it would drive you crazy, you know? So you need to have some, um, so some situations need to be responded to right away, reasonably. It's like 50-50, but some they need to wait and you need to cultivate both for them. Okay. Um, and so one example of, of getting them to wait would be if I'm talking to somebody and of course she's young, she comes in and uh, interrupts. Now, again, it might be that her interruption is reasonable and I might disconnect from the adult I'm speaking to and trigger the hell out of them <laughs> by doing that and go to her because it might be a reasonable interruption. But if not, and I, I'm, I'm in this conversation, what I would do when she comes up is I put my hand on her shoulder or on her head, stroke her and let her know she got my attention and let her know and just like stroke her in a way like I'm with her and that I'd wait and she'd wait. She'd know that I was engaged with her. She'd wait. And then once this part of the conversation finished, I'd then come to, yes, honey. So it's cultivating things like that. And so sometimes responding quickly 
uh, and other times going okay and, but not but this is the problem it can be um that good communication in these moments like so when you're in the middle of something and they're coming interrupting you're like no go away leave me alone you know it's like that's not good they'll just want more of your attention mm. right it's like they more, want more of what they're not getting because they they want your safety and they want your love and you've really cut that off in that moment so it's like if they're interrupting you so what i would do so i'm in the middle of something here maybe it's work wise okay and she comes interrupts i go honey i'm just in the middle of this right now but once i'm finished this i'll be right with you okay and then and then being completely here and then stopping and being completely there you know not splitting myself in two you know by interacting like with frustration intermittently while i'm doing what i'm doing here okay so it's like again it's that re loving supportive reasonable communication is just and so in that moment instead of feeling cut off and unsafe She'll feel connected. She'll have the ability as a five-year-old, six-year-old, or whatever you know, have the ability that you've you've now helped her connect with to wait, mm. you know, and then cultivate that. But if the mistake's been made, um, you, you're going to need to go through a process where they feel that distress, they express that distress, you hold that space, and you get to those better outcomes together, um, and apply the necessary consequence to motivate them. Um, and you know, then get to that improved behavior, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it takes, like I said, it takes some time, but with consistency, that time can be days, you know, really. So I think the, the, the major thing that I took from, from that was when, if you are applying some like discipline or rules that, that maybe haven't been there before, um, to, you still want to come from a place of love and empathy, not which I think is probably a form of self-protection, like, right, well, I told you, like, that's what it's going to be, like, um, which is uh, not not probably helpful. And, and I guess I think it's probably more about the parent trying to put on a facade just because it's a, maybe a difficult situation that they're not used to doing. Um, so it's, it's still coming from love, still coming from empathy, but just... Um, following through and and still supporting them through that distress if it causes if there is distress then uh being there for them to, to help them through that that's it because well for, the first part of that as a parent is to take ownership over the fact that you created the problem mm. and it's not their fault you know parenting typically is the process of um conditioning children to act a certain way and then disciplining them for acting that way mm. You know, because you are embodiedly teaching them how to behave. And then when they reflect it back to you, you don't like it. And that's really traumatic. And that, that causes a specifically a trauma of unfairness and resentment, which becomes internalized. And then unfairness becomes, that's one of the main reasons that unfairness becomes internalized. And um, we have it playing out as adults. It's because you've been taught to act a certain way by modeling, which is exactly what you should be doing. You should be modeling the behavior of your guardians in order to understand how to exist in this environment. That's exactly mm -hmm. what you should be doing. And you're doing exactly what you should be doing. And then you get told off for it and treated badly for it. It's a horrible dynamic. Mm -hmm. And then that unfairness, which is traumatic, becomes internalized and then becomes lived out as part of your own story. You know, So it's uh, very important that we don't do that. It's very important. And again, you know, this is a, a one and a half hour, maybe two hour we'll see podcast where I'm laying this stuff out for. And there's a lot of things to, to change within this, but perhaps studying this podcast again and again and again, applying the lessons can mean that, um, you know, you can make these changes within yourself and for yourself and for your, your child, um, because it's, you know, it's repatterning yourself. We're talking about, you know, but it's, if we connect with why we're doing it, you know, it's like to all of us, when we get deep with our values and meaning, children are the most important things to us. Mm -hmm. um, and you connect with that, that meaning with why you're making these efforts to, to adapt things in this way. Um, you know, you can, you can get yourself, you can get yourself there and then make these enormous differences into what you're passing on to your children. Um, and then you can establish like, like reasonable escalations towards telling a kid off if you need to. You can get to these reasonable escalations. Almost always I use the four stages, but there might be occasions when like there's a telling off because something's happened. It's like, 
it's an unacceptable behavior or thing you know it's like letting them know that as well occasionally this is more rare that i do this but letting her know that and applying that consequence um and she feels bad about it you know because feeling bad isn't a bad thing feeling if feeling a bad becomes a, a helpful for a positive orientation you know um but having a reasonable escalation to that you know is very important and can be consistent with that reasonable explanation e escalation you know so start lovingly and supportively and firmness and forthrightness should come later much later funnily enough david i am um, i actually i actually messed up just the other day and i was i overreacted um with her and i made a video on this and which i'm going to share but i I, sh I should perhaps share share it now is um so I was, I was, I was stretched and struggling, you know, difficulty with my health. And I, sometimes I'm very, very stretched. Applying all of this makes things absolutely fantastic for me for, for the most part, you know, not having all of this would make them desperately difficult. Well, this particular day I overreacted to something. Um, and I spoke to it in a way that wasn't, wasn't loving and supportive. And it was actually like, I, my old thing was actually, I was, I was overreacting to her overreaction, <laughs> you know? So I was like, she was overreacting to something. It's like something I really wanted her to get on top of um, because, you know, melodrama isn't something that helps anyone. And, and anyway, I've reacted to it and I disciplined it in a way and I didn't follow the stages and I didn't do any of that stuff. Um, so then I felt bad about it afterwards, David. And it's like, good, it's good that I felt bad. Um, now, Feeling bad doesn't necessarily mean that I did anything wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But feeling bad means that I should check in and see. Check in and see if I should, if there's something I did that isn't good enough. And I checked in and I saw. Um, and again, this is the feeling focused approach which, which permeates all of my work. It's okay, I feel bad about something. Well, be in and with it. What is this? Then you see something that you don't want to see, which is you're wrong. Um, and then, you know, you own that. It's like, okay, I react. I didn't do, I should have just been supportive there. I should have just been loving. That's what I should have been. And just, and I should have parented through that. So I'd actually, um, I actually wasn't with her by this stage because I, I left shortly after. Um, so I called her first and I said, honey, I just want you to know that I'm really sorry about the way I spoke to you. Um, so it's going through this process first of ownership and feeling to clarity, right? But then it's like, and now I've got something, I've got to do something too. And that's using what you're feeling for what it's for. It's, it's exactly what it's for, to see something. So it's being in and with it first, see, figuring things out, then doing something about that thing. And so I'm really sorry, honey. It wasn't good enough. I love using those words because it's vilified in self-help world generally. Not good enough. But I like, you know, not being good enough is an important thing to be able to own when you're not good enough. Mm. And that means you won't have this wonky relationship to it. So you won't need to just stress about it and, have all of this no you are good enough which doesn't really change a damn thing for anybody that wasn't good enough honey um and you know what i should have done is this and i promise you I'm, i'll do my best to do better next time which is one of my go-tos i'll do my best to do better it's very precise language um and uh, if i do slip up again you know you need to know that you know that that that's that's well actually i'm just jumping in she responded already to this she said that's okay dad which speaks for our relationship, right? Because I hardly ever, this hardly ever happens. But the reason it hardly ever happens, David, is because of this process I'm going through, mm. because of I've repatterned myself through that process to not do it. Um, but she said, that's okay, Dad. Now, that's a nice little out for me to go, oh, okay, everything's okay. But no, I'm, it's not okay. So I needed her to know that. I'm going, so first I appreciate where she was coming from. I said, I really appreciate that, honey pie. I appreciate, you know, you're accepting my sorry. I really do. But um, actually, it's not okay. And I, and I need us both to know that it's not okay and to acknowledge it's not okay. All right? It's not okay that daddy speaks like that and I will do better. And I need you to know it's not okay. So if I slip up again, you know, you can let me know if I haven't noticed first. Right? And that's okay. Um, so it's like to, to, so be, to be able to then... I'm, I'm so happy, even though I'm not happy with what I did, what I did with it. So the thing was bad. What I did with it was good. And I end up being able to embody a proper sorry. Um, and I end up being able to impart a lesson of, you know, you can forgive something and accept a sorry without, without it being okay, what happened as well. 
you know, and the, both those things can exist. And that was all, you know, so that, you know, I did everything right then because of how deeply I owned how much I got it wrong. And that was very, very important. And that's, that's the, my journey as a parent for the most part, um, which honestly I feel really good about. Our relationship's amazing. Um, she's, she had a lot of confident crisis because of how turbulent her early development stages were. Um, a lot of issues we, we needed to help her through, like really deep confident issues. And, and now she's like, you know, she's doing, I mean, she had anxiety, some anxiety episodes as well. And, She's doing great, David. It's through this. And it's it's through my transformation and applying these approaches. Yeah, that's very powerful. And I, th- I like what you said about the the reason to do this, like that, because when you spoke about that that these triggers that will inevitably occur when we see our kid doing something, because we're transported back at uh, the the why or the motivation for being able to just pause or not just go into the unconscious pattern is because like your child is is you can benefit immensely and, and so can you but it's like if we ever need a, a big enough motivation you know the 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 child is you know you can't get a bigger motivation than that because it's something that you can give them that that maybe you never had and That's and it. also to heal yourself in the process or get over that thing in the process so it isn't like just they're getting a bit of everybody's benefiting that's it man it's like your meaning as you know when we, we did some brief work together mm. a part of process was connecting to meaning yeah and you, you know how powerful that is um connecting to meaning will be the reason that you orient yourself in the direction towards who you really want to be and become and what you really want to create rather than go into the same seductive patterns of cycles and dysfunction, self-sabotage and all those things that you don't want, you know, being connected to the meaning of why it is you're taking, you're walking in this direction. So you've got to be, I like to say, armed to your heart with meaning. And the reason a lot of the time we're not getting close enough connecting to our meaning is because um, it may be uh, encased in bad feelings maybe encased in regrets, guilt or shame. And you have to go into and through that feeling bad to get to, like the reason it feels bad is because it means something to you. That's why it feels bad. Mm. And if you're going to avoid that bad feeling, you're going to avoid connecting deeply to your meaning. And you need your meaning. You need your meaning to be able to draw courage from it, draw courage and strength to be able to step forward in life in the way you want, to be able to, uh, go beyond obstacles, go beyond the challenges, to be able to navigate well, to be able to not fall into the seductive patterns, but take that, that difficult, prickly path, uh, an uncomfortable path to, to the things you've never done but need to do. Mm. You know, and that, that comes from being able to really grasp your regrets, your shames, your guilt, whatever it is that feels bad, get into the, the heart of what it means to you and then bring that with you because when you're armed with that meaning suddenly you can do that thing you you know you could because you draw strength and courage from it but without that man that's why that's why people find change so damn difficult david mm. you know because there's constant avoidance from the bad feeling you know constant avoidance but that there's a treasure trove of meaning there for you that you can draw strength and courage from man it's like without that it's really tough and of course mm. people two steps forward three steps back you know whatever it is whether it's like lifestyle changes parental changes, relationship changes, whatever it is you're trying to change within yourself and express yourself differently in the world, it's going to be really difficult because you're working against these, um, these forces, these underlying psychological forces, which have been conditioned in your early childhood predominantly. Mm. And you're trying to work against them. Well, how do you do that? How, what, what you need, you need to increase the gravity of those choices you want to make for the better and that you increase that gravity by infusing meaning within them and connecting very deeply with that then you can do it then you can do it but without that man impossibly hard so we have to go on that prickly path somewhat david as i know you've heard me say many many times in other yeah. videos um and get you know but this idea that the reason it feels bad is because there's meaning there for you it's like and it might be the most meaningful thing to you like your highest value because it might be connected to your children 
Mm. And we and we do, we avoid that. And that's why, you know, I don't, I just don't like this saccharine stuff about there's no, you know, not actually saying that some parenting's bad parenting. I don't like that at all. I, I don't like infantilizing people. I don't think it's doing anyone any good. You know, it's like, you know, like, come on, that's in the right way through hopefully this kind of dialogue. Mm. Identify how things work and identify, yeah, the, when, when we can do better and where we should do better and having the right guidance and support to be able to do that, you know, um, but let's not let ourselves off the hook um, from doing that work because, um, you know, it, for my personal, me personally, I, you know, I have a high standard of what kind of father I want to be. And it's, it is, it, you know, if it's the most meaningful thing in the world to you, that you're a good parent, then let's do the work, you know, let's do the work. Um, and I'm not going to sit here saying it's okay to be a shit parent when really, really you want to be a, you want to be a better one. You know, I, I really want to, um, you know, when I talk to people, you know, I, and see them, I, I include their potential in that, you know? Um, and, um, you know, it's like when this, we talk about acceptance and self-acceptance, it's like, well, don't accept how you are, <laughs> you know, don't accept how you are. That's a terrible idea. You know, um, you've got to accept your potential. Your potential has got to be in there. It's got to be in the mix of your acceptance, in which case there's some things you need to reject that are getting in the way of you living out your potential, you know? So, you know, some of these ideas of acceptance, are not real, it's faux acceptance actually. And it's just like um, a coping mechanism and uh, self-justification, you know? Because if you're not, if, if, you're, if you're excluding your potential in what you accept, then how is that acceptance? And isn't it better to have an orientation of accepting your potential and reject those things that are getting in the way for you being able to reach your potential. Yeah. Way better there. Way better. Definitely. And I think I should, I, I presume you mean that do you like accept your feelings as well? You know? So it, it's okay uh, if, if, if you're feeling a certain feeling um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that that means that you shouldn't do the thing or you shouldn't strive for better. Um, but it's, it's, it's not like a rejection of the feeling that, that, that you're talking about. No. So again, you know, we've got to be nuanced about this, haven't we? Yeah. I what just I just clarify that. Bit yeah. Thank I you just, for that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that, Dave. But what I just laid out in my experience with my daughter mm. was that it was an acceptance of how I felt, mm -hmm. or you can say a meeting of how I felt, you know, or an embracing of how I felt. There's so many ways, you know, obviously we're dealing with a metaphor, right? Feeling is really the closest we can get with language, feeling how I felt, but not accepting the thing I did. Mm. So it's like, so there's an acceptance experience going on with how you're feeling while a, re while a rejection of something you did. And again, mm. people conflate those things and it causes them a lot of problems. It's like, you know, well, here's where we accept, but it might mean not accepting that. And, and here's the thing, Dave, it's like, you might need to accept that you don't accept that, <laughs> right? It's like, so the, the acceptance is, this is, this is the problem again with so much of self-help. It's so, it's so missing in context and nuance. Truths of our inner world aren't necessarily true of the outer, but those things get conflated a lot. And acceptance is one of those things. It's mm -hmm. like, um, because we have the, um, you know, the meme, um, what we resist persists. Yeah. But that, that's true of the inner world. It's not true of the outer world. Um, you know, if, um, if you threw a ball to me and I put my hand up and caught it, I'd be resisting the trajectory of the ball. It would not continue flying through my hand. Persist. It would not persist. <laughs> right. Um, and so that, that, that's important to understand because many yeah. things you need to, so, and what I've seen people like the more, I, I guess the people that have in the more spiritual self-help directions who, and haven't received enough nuance for their guidance <clears throat> is they're trying to live out this non-resistance thing. And they're in total resistance about it, you know, um, and it's like they're just in total turmoil and there's a spiritual bypassing happening or, or emotional bypassing happening, trying to live out this non-resistance when what they need to do, because the interesting thing is while they're trying to accept that, they're not accepting what they feel, which is they don't want to accept it. Mm. You know, mm. So they're actually not doing the thing they really need to do. You know, by falling into this misunderstanding and externalizing the truth and going, right, I'm trying to accept that, they're actually in all this resistance because what they're the messages, the messengers within their emotional matrix is saying is no, reject that, don't accept that, change that, you know. 
So it needs to be, okay, accept that. And that might be that you don't accept that. You might be pissed off about that. You know, whatever it is, don't try and change this. Feel this. Accept this. Change that. Okay? If you need to. Mm. If you need to. Um, but you might find once through accepting this, you don't actually need to do anything about it because it might have been your relationship to it. That might have been the thing. And through an embrace, a facing and embracing of your own emotions and a meeting of yourself more fully, you, you don't need to because you transmute that relationship. It's a big subject to just open up at the end of our time together. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but of course, in other many other videos, you know, mine and perhaps we can we can even talk about this stuff together. I you know I map all of that out. Um, so that's that's something to be mindful of. It's yeah, we what we do is we feel here as fully as we can. We meet ourselves fully, right? And it's really come in and with that emotion, and then we can then get clearer. And then it is we can take action about something that we may need to change. Um, and certainly, you know, when I, this is the thing, when I accept how I'm feeling, um, but I reject in some form what I've done that I'm feeling this way about, there's a coherence there. Because I, that's, I'm accepting that I, you know, because I'm, what I'm connecting to is my meaning, David, you know? So it's like I'm connecting to that isn't good enough. So I'm feeling that that isn't good enough and I'm accepting how I feel while going, that isn't good enough. So in a form I'm accepting this and rejecting that and, and how I can create that situation with my daughter I just talked about is through that process, you know, which is um, it's deep and unusual, but it's, it's the direction for us to go in, you know, so whatever it is that's emerging within our relationship to life emotionally, it's being able to embrace that and be in and with that, you know, that's, so the first step is acknowledgement acknowledge how you feel that's the first step and that's a courageous step and it also ha it has courage and acceptance in it actually because if you're acknowledging something you 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 are having the courage to acknowledge it exists that and you might not want it to exist within you or around you so acknowledgement of something has that courage of yes this exists and that also has a level of acceptance because if it exists you're and you're acknowledging it exists you're accepting that it does exist so acknowledgement has these beautiful beginnings of courage and acceptance that we need um, mm. to be able to transmute our, our emotional experience in a healthy way. So one of the big problems that we're experiencing with parenthood is <clears throat> we're corrupting um, the relationship between earning and reward um, and, or, or effort and reward effort and outcome. It's, this is so important because, you know, millions of years of evolution, say you need to put effort in to get something yeah and that so that's how we work neurophysiologically that's how we work from the nervous system up right uh, what that means is you know in, in nature if we needed a shelter we needed to build the shelter if we needed food we needed to source the food forage the food hunt the food we couldn't just go and stand next to a tree with our head in the air and our mouth open and the honey's going to fall into it mm. right? that isn't how life works um, and it's because that isn't how life works. That's not how we work. Okay. So we have adapted to life, how that works. Okay. This is really important. And this, this speaks to, um, I never hear this spoken about David. I haven't heard this identified or spoken about, um, but it speaks to like, um, a pathology that we, we really need to address. Okay. So we need to put in that effort to source the honey. We need to put in that effort to climb the tree and navigate, negotiate with the bees to get the honey. I don't mean sit down and talk to the bees. I mean, physically negotiate getting the honey <laughs> for the bees. Um, right. We need to do that. And then when we've done that, David, we feel good. So effort feel good because we've got the outcome and that's how you get the outcome is putting in the effort. You feel good and you share it with your family. That goodness expands. Okay. And that's how we've evolved. Mm -hmm. So within our internal psychological, emotional matrices, that's how shit works. Okay. It's that way around. So some, one of the things I've, I've looked to, um, and again, it's not conditioning, it's um, cultivating and, and, and making sure I affirm a good relationship with, with my daughter is, you, and this is what I say to her, you do what you need to do first, then you get to do what you want to do. <clears throat> so again, with the watching of programs, she doesn't get to watch any in the mornings. It's like, uh, and it'd be like, dad, dad's going to watch pro, honey, you don't get to watch programs in the morning. You've got to get yourself together. You've got a tidy room. You've got some things to do. You've got some schooling to do. All that stuff needs to get done first. Then you get to do watch some programs. Okay. Now I experimented, David. I didn't want to be ignorant and think I'm, you know, I'm completely right about this. So I went for a period of time. I said, okay, honey, um, 
you can watch a program, but afterwards you've got to do this, that. Really difficult to get to do the thing afterwards. Yeah. And that's because once the outcome, the positive outcome, the reward has been triggered, literally our being is pulling us into sedation now. Mm. It's like you've already got the thing. You don't need to, you clearly don't need to put in the effort to get the thing because you've got the thing. Mm. And this is really what people are struggling with, with what we could call credit card consciousness now. We live in an abundant world. We can have things before putting in effort. And that, that's really disrupting us psychologically and making life very, very difficult for us. Because if we reward ourselves before putting in the effort, we are triggering, um, uh, we're triggering a mechanism to go, we've already put in the effort. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to now. So if you've, so what we've done is we've tricked our psyche, we've tricked our, our, our physiology to believe we've already put in the effort because we've already got the outcome. Now at that point, what should you do after you've got the honey and shed it with your family? Mm. You should rest. You should conserve energy because conserving energy is important. So if you're disrupting that, that linear system, which is effort first reward later, if you're disrupting that, you are going to feel that all of your being is going to pull you into inaction. So we're doing that with our children a lot now, right? A lot. It's like, just, you know, because it feels uncomfortable that they're not getting what they want. So give them what they want, give them it mm. endlessly. And then get, try, now try and get them to do the thing you want them to do. Impossibly difficult. And, and again, we're, we're working against millions of years of evolution. That's the undercurrent, the psychological mm. forces we're working against. Really tough. So we need, to, we need to disentangle ourselves and get the straight line, which is effort first, reward later. And we do that, uh, you know, Please, please, parents watching this, um, it's the most almighty gift you can give your child's psychological development to be able to put that in the right order, okay, to ensure that they're putting in some effort for what they get. They've got a good relationship with merit, with merit, with earning and reward, okay, that then, because otherwise, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a recipe for depression. We're actually conditioning depression because we're conditioning laziness and inactivity. We're conditioning sedation. Okay. And we're completely corrupting this system. We're so disorientated inside. So we've got to get that in a straight line, effort first, reward later. Okay. So I just wanted to put that in because it's huge and it's a massive problem for us, not just as parents, but for our culture and us yeah. as adults. I, you know? I, was, I was thinking about that um, as you spoke, and it's probably for the for the amount of people that we're talking about like the first time in in human history that that, that our environment has existed um because yeah only within the last maybe 70 years have we had the abundance of stuff and uh entertainment and nice food and and like the the basics have been met and so the the yeah, every other part of human history is there's been a lot more effort and a lot yeah. less abundance. And of course, it's nice to have things in abundance. But as you you mentioned, it, it it has a disruptive effect. And something I've observed in um because I'm working in a in a high school at the moment, and that, that there is um not all of the students, but some, there's a, a kind of sense of entitlement that, oh, I should get this thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, I want this thing, yeah. should I get it? Like, and I, I think that is probably why, because that, that they've been brought up in that fashion. And, and also I think appreciating it, it must, for parents, it's hard, like keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, they've got an iPhone. I should get my kid an iPhone. And, you know, yeah. they're wearing uh, Nike Air Max 25 or whatever. I need to get my kid Nike Air Max 25. <laughs> so it's, um, I, I'm, you know, I appreciate it. Might, it must be kind of hard for a parent because you're probably getting pressure from, from your kid and pressure from what you see around you. Uh, but I, I have witnessed that that, that is... Um, in some students, not all of them, there's kind of a sense of entitlement, like, oh, what that I should, why should I have to work for that, or why should I have to do that thing? Um, yeah. That I feel is probably coming from that kind of uh, environment. Yeah, I would say that as this system has been disrupted, as I'm talking about, um, and it's like well, they don't know, 
they, 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 don't, they don't have a good relationship now with the effort and reward system that's, that's fundamental mm. if it's how life works it's how like just it's just how life works um so yeah we do have all this abundance so it's very important that we actually understand how we work internally how life works so um we can we can manage ourselves within that abundance mm. um and so i mean and what we what what we give it then means whatever we have has a different value to it david um so this experience i had with my daughter was um so i mentioned she had some anxiety issues um and she was a gym she's a gym she was a gymnast she's a trampolinist now but she um wouldn't do competitions. she was very nervous about doing the competitions um, which was holding her back because and again competition is just a part of the development process which mm. I, I enjoyed thereafter talking to her about and engagement with her about but um she wouldn't do it so and she was just had all this fear so i'm like okay what can i put in her as a as an incentive to motivate her that will get her character and strength to overcome that fear and that thing happened just happened to be an iphone right now she's nine years old and i didn't want her to have an iphone nine years old, but it mm. was the thing and it was more important that i get her you know not just doing the competition but becoming the person that can do the competition that's mm. the thing and that's only going to happen through that process of doing it experientially so it's like okay honey if you do that competition it doesn't matter where you come i'm gonna get you an iphone now she went and done that competition and when she came back um it wasn't about the iphone she was like as happy as i've ever seen her in, in, my, in her life she was absolutely because that accomplishment that overcoming herself and that growth she was absolutely and she just from that moment there was a period of time where it's just like i can just cop anything i can do anything it was such mm. a big experience but she needed that motivation right but it was an effort reward thing i wasn't going to give her the iphone before she did the competition here's the thing david I've given, if i'd given her the iphone before she'd have never done it she would have mm. come to it the fear would have hit and she wouldn't have done it so this was so important and then she does it and it's that experience was amazing and then she ends up like she came third actually which was amazing um and but then she went on to do other competitions like and came first in most of them and on trampolining she got a lot of gold she's won international golds um and you know soon after she's like you know what i love most about gymnastics trampoline now she's like and i'm like well honey she goes to competitions you know and this was someone that was terrified of them mm. but then my favorite part of this story is a huge amount of time after it's like maybe you know, six to ten months later and she's she loves her phone right she we we moderate her use of it um but she goes uh, we're driving and she, she said dad you know what i love most about my phone us uh, and i'm thinking oh she loves the apps and games she loves texting her friends uh, <laughs> i don't i don't know honey what's the thing i don't know what is it the most you love about it that i earned it you were nine years old when she said that day mm. because the earning of it gave it a different value and that value was had significance, you know, and that value she valued. So she valued this thing. And that's another way to get, you know, it's like this conveyor belt gifts at Christmas situation where kids just need that, yeah, that there's no appreciation for the thing. And they don't, how, how have we seen kids not looking after their stuff, not mm. taking care of things because the, their subjective value isn't within the thing because they didn't earn it. Mm. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shitty way to experience life, you know? We may think we're being, it's a, David, it's like this giving of gifts too much um, and without stimulating an effort and earning reward system, um, it's actually a substitute for deep love because it's far more deeply loving to cultivate the kind of thing that that experience I had with Emily when she's like, I love this phone because I earned it. It's like, mm. man, that's immense. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, one year she didn't get, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm so close to the end. Um, part of this process in the uh, early stages when we were trying to really help her move forward, um, one year I didn't, we didn't give her any Christmas presents. I thought you were going to say that, Richie. <laughs> um, and it was the best thing we ever did for her best thing we ever did and my family you can't do that now to be clear other family members got to give her presents but the ones we had for which she really wanted like these whole stables and this kind of stuff she didn't get because her behavior was such it was just wasn't working right and it was like we needed this stimulus so i said honey not going to get christmas presents unless this and it didn't happen 
so she didn't get them. But I tell you what, man, because of the process I took, it's not like she kicked up a fuss and was really, she wasn't angry towards me. You know, she knew she, it was her responsibility. Um, she got, and she, we had a fine Christmas. She just didn't get her main presents, right? Mm. And uh, it was her birthday on the 11th of January. So that's a short period of time. So it's like, okay, well, you can earn them by then. She still didn't. So she didn't get them for her birthday either. Um, but within a week from her birthday, when it really slotted in, I'm not getting these. Yeah. She did. She did what she needed to do. And it was very significant. I won't go into the details, but it's concerned her anxieties and I need to motivate her. Um, and it was really causing a problem for her. She did. She conquered the issue. Um, she got all the things. She And I tell you, man, that was such an amazing process for her. Um, she felt great about it took complete ownership over the situation um and thereafter um through that experience it really helped with this process because she really knew that yeah if i don't if i don't act a certain way and i'm not talking about radical policing i'm very flexible with her expressing herself but it's like yeah. if i don't put in the, the efforts i need to for myself and for things i need to do and get done um, I, I don't get the things mm. I don't, she gets my love always, but things are not love, right? They're a substitute for it. Always make sure the rewards, like if, if she's, if I really want to reward her, I'll reward her with like my time, like, uh, and an experience with me, like, mm. you know, what you, do you want to do with me? If there's anything to do, oh, dad, let's go and do this. You know, and it can be something really simple. It could be kicking a ball in the back garden, you know? But um, it's very important that love comes with my connection, my time. Um, and then, and like I say, through this process, we horrified my family. It was the best thing we ever did for her, man. It really helped her move forward. And it really helped with, with everything I'm laying out. And I may have lost 99% of the people that are watching this now at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> the bad guy. He wears shades in girls. He doesn't give his kids presents. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly. But, man... Uh, I don't know any bond of love like mine and my daughter's. And I think what, what, what stood out for just there, you, you said you, you, you're not withholding love. So it's not like, well, I'm not going to hug you on Christmas or, uh, <laughs> you know, go to your room and lock the door. Like it, it wasn't that you were withholding love. It was the, the material items that, that, that yeah. we're talking about, not, yeah. not being moody and saying, okay, you've, you're not going to receive any kind of love from me. Exactly right, man. It's to, exactly. It's the effort to get in the material hmm. because if you don't go to work, your employer isn't going to pay you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think and, that's a really important point because to understand it might be misconstrued. Um, but yeah, you, you, you're not withholding love. You're just that the reward is the physical reward of whatever the presence, but that gets the value or the meaning from the effort that, that you that's um, it. you give it yeah that's it and she loved those gifts far more than she would have had if we'd have given in and just let her have them despite the fact that her attitude and behavior didn't adjust yeah um and also you know what can be more loving than helping her you know because again understanding the depths of developmental psychology giving her what she needs in the infrastructures of her own mind to live the best life she could live and be the happy mm -hmm. and it, and again that orientation creates happiness that orientation of effort and reward is what creates happiness and accomplishment all of these things create happiness in the deepest ways mm. so it's like you know people can judge me but um i'll just judge you right back <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking i won't not much a little yeah lovingly lovingly Wow, that's a, a great story to end on there, Richie. Um, and if if people want to get in touch and uh, learn how to not give kids presents, no, or learn about <laughs> more, more about your work, when um, we come to my my evil grotto, yeah, uh, how to save money at Christmas. That's that's what I'm going to call my coaching. For <laughs> uh, then, yeah, where's the best place for them to get in touch? Um, you can get touch in two main places. Uh, there's a chat box on my website. Uh, now, one thing you can do is go to my website, which is richiewatson.uk. That's Richie without an E, R-I-C-H-I, Watson.uk, not .co.uk.uk. 
and there's a chat box there. You can also sign up to my, my weekly video guidance newsletter that I send out, which is a, a, a few minute video clip that I extract from live videos that I've done um, with some context, written context. It's basically five minutes to engage with every Saturday, late morning, midday kind of time. Um, so that's that's something I really encourage people to do because it's such, it, and, and it's something I give away, you know, it's, um, it, it really helps me, um, you know, something people can engage with and continually develop, which feels really good to give away. So that's there on my website, which you can sign up to. There's a chat box there. You can get in touch with me there, or you can get in touch with me via messenger on Facebook. That's a pretty decent way to, um, to catch me. I've got, that's pretty much exclusively used, you know, professionally. So, um, you know, I'm, I welcome, I welcome all, uh, all contact and reaching out and connection so cool well thank you for uh taking the time and it's been really interesting i've definitely learned a lot oh cool brother good you know good uh i know and thank you for allowing me the space to unpack things fully because it's important um, yeah you know. I, I don't, don't want to rush it because i know you've got a lot of insight and i think these are really deep topics and, and very important ones as well cool brother cool well like you know if, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, we'd be delighted to do it again sometime cool thanks richie thanks man thank you for watching please subscribe and if you enjoyed the video hit the like button hit the bell button to be updated on all the latest videos you can check me out on instagram at david bailey life coach